distinguished panelists, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. As you have just heard, the theme of this session that is countering the global rise of protectionism policies for sustainable growth. Uh, there are a few questions that I will put to the panelists, and they will elaborate upon these questions. And thereafter, there will be, after each short intervention, there will be a discussion among the panelists. First of all, we can note, what we will know, that there's much talk about the new protectionism. We know that we had the golden age of globalization in the 90s and in the beginning of the 20s up till the financial crisis of 2008. Free trade was considered to be good to everyone. Thereafter, after the financial crisis in 2008, we have had what some people call a globalization, with a lot of countermeasures hampering foreign direct investment and the flow of free trade. So, uh, one question uh, to the panel is, all these hard facts that we have seen in the last years, have, they, uh, have these conditions uh, done that uh, the, uh, the conditions for global trade have worsened? A second question is, concerns the causes for the new protectionism. Which are the main causes? There are many main causes. There are many causes, as for example, economic uh, conditions, uh, new technology causes, social causes, environmental causes, and so on. So, which are the most important causes to the new protectionism? And what do that do? These causes signify? Is it a temporary breather? of liberalization or a more prolonged backlash that we are experiencing. And the last, uh, the third question to the panel is uh, what is the impact of this new protectionism? Uh, do we see a weakening of multilateral trade or for FDI? Do we see a strengthening of regional arrangements, or what do we see? And then, last but not least, but that we will take in the, in the very end, that is, where do we believe that we will stand five to ten years from now? And what should be res the responses, and what should be the remedies to this uh, new, so-called new protectionism? First of all, I would like to give the floor to um, Andrea Goldstein, who is a senior economist from the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD. Please, Andrea. Thanks, Kai, and thanks a lot to the organizers for this invitation, which was initially addressed to the Secretary General of the OECD, which was very pleased and honored, but unfortunately couldn't make it. But of course, uh, I can uh, convey his sentiment uh, to the ruler of uh, uh, Dubai and to the organizing committee that uh, this aim is very important for us. And uh, let me say, first of all, that it was very inspirational to listen to President Morales because I guess even if he didn't address uh, specifically the issues that are of concern in our panel, obviously he gave a very interesting presentation of a general topic which is, of course, uh, the backdrop uh, against which we take uh, this conversation further. And uh, I'd like to take uh, the first question from uh, Kai of uh, the protectionism from uh, a quantitative and uh, fact-based uh, uh, perspective, which is uh, to say whether there is, in fact, a rise in protectionism as far as investment, international investment, cross-border investment is concerned. And there the evidence is, to some extent, mixed. I think it's a very important point because otherwise we there is also evidence that FDI is declining, and we have to be careful not to um, 
say that this decline in FDI is due to protections because it's, it may be one of the causes, one of the factors underlying this fall in FDI, but obviously it's not the only one, and in fact it may not be even the most important to the extent that uh, the protectionism, uh, the rise of, of protectionism is not very apparent. And this is the evidence that comes out from our um, biannual reporting to the G20 on trade and uh, investment protections, which we do together with uh, the WTO and uh, UNCTAD. And uh, as far as uh, uh, investment is concerned, uh, there is still uh, uh, quite some evidence that uh, liberalizing measures are more outweighed uh, uh, protectionist measures. What is true, on the other hand, is that new forms of protections, or at least the new forms of regulation, which are called protections, are emerging. And these have to do with uh, a number of factors. The first one, which was uh, at the center of the discussion in the previous session, is technological change, which is leading to concerns uh, regarding data and privacy. And uh, as a result, uh, as we know, the data is what makes uh, is the real gold of the 21st century in the digital economy. And countries want to protect the data and, in fact, to keep the data inside the, the borders. And so we see a rise of data localization requirements, which is a form of protectionism. And there is a second concern, uh, and I will, I will stick to the three minutes. I don't know how many I've spent, but uh, hopefully there I still have a few seconds. Um, there is a, a second element, which is uh, the rising importance of uh, state-linked, state-controlled, state-managed uh, uh, entities. I use this vague term because uh, there was, uh, this has been going on for 10 years now. Initially, the concerns were with uh, uh, sovereign wealth funds, and that led to the um, uh, OECD principles on host uh, countries' policies towards sovereign wealth funds, but also to the Santiago principles by the IMF on uh, the uh, governance of state of uh, sovereign wealth funds. Now we have a second phase of this, which is the rising importance of state-owned enterprises as uh, international investors, and this is uh, giving rise to new concerns and to new forms of regulation, which instead of, which are linked to, to security concerns, and uh, we know that there have been limits to foreign investment in certain sectors for many years now. Now we are moving to a second phase where this uh, uh, controls so or these uh, policies address uh, on a broad level the security implications of uh, international investment. But all in all, I don't see a rise in protections. I see new forms of protections as it, w when you speak uh, about uh, investment. Obviously, there is uh, the trade protections, which is having an impact on international investment. But this is a slightly different story. Thanks, Kai. Thank you so much, Andrea. And now I will give the floor to Amal Mohammed El Mala. She is the Chief of the Office for Arab States International Trade Center. Please, Amal. Hi, everyone. It's my pleasure to meet you today. Um, uh, before my work uh, with the ITC in Geneva, I was also a private, senior private sector development specialist uh, with focus on investment policy and trade at the World Bank. And uh, I support uh, uh, and agree with uh, my OECD colleague on his assessment. Uh, but I need to add to that that uh, in light of the questions uh, raised by Kai, um, in, in, in the sense of uh, trade-led investment, it is very important uh, to understand that companies and businesses are continuing to do business. And protectionism will not be a hindrance and stopping business as usual. Um, that's why ITC believes very much in the internationalization concept and how to help governments and private sector find uh, uh, the coping mechanism because the convergence between trade and investment is very apparent and one of uh, the, the areas where we found that uh, governments and private sector could find uh, a safe haven is uh, developing more on uh, the regional uh, integration concepts. Um, and for this year, it is uh, our priority in uh, the Office for Arab States to work together with the African Union uh, to build uh, with other development partners on uh, the Arab-African Bridge initiatives because within regionalism, private sector and governments uh, could really uh, counteract the vulnerability of uh, uh, protectionism 
and uh, take different uh, forms of uh, uh, trade uh, favorable reforms. Thank you, Amal. And now I give the floor to Bernardo Calzadilla. He is the director of the Department of Trade, Investment and Innovation at the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, UNIDO. Please, Bernardo. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. UNIDO stands for Industrial Development. As such, our emphasis is to look at the manufacturing sector, and the hard facts uh, are right. Uh, you, uh, there has been a, a tremendous decline in uh, investment in the manufacturing sector, but at the same time, and this is maybe something that we should look at, you mentioned during the introduction, there are a number of mega trends that are going on, uh, and the response will be also multifaceted. Uh, Andrea also mentioned that we don't have one cause, there is a new protectionism, there is not a dichotomy here. We have the trade tension, we have migration, uh, we have climate change as mega trends. And I would like to say the most important mega trend which this uh, event is also discussing is technology, technological transformation. And as such, I think uh, just to focus on one element, and you wanted also to look at where we'll be standing in the future, I think that the most important uh, element is that for the last 50 years, low labor costs have been one important driver of investment. So investment went to Asia, East Asia, to China, Vietnam, and all these uh, dragon countries because there was cheap labor. And today, many countries in Africa and Latin America are still managing to attract investment based on that. But this will be changed in the future. Technology, automation, robotics, is uh, causing a very strong uh, trend of reshoring, and this will change uh, the way investment will take decisions, which still be linked to resources and commodities, but it will have to happen in a, in a different manner. Uh, the countries will need to prepare better. I think we heard it in all the occasions. We need better regulation. We need better regulation framework, uh, business environment frameworks, uh, uh, and we need infrastructure. We need absolutely, uh, and all this combination of infrastructure, regulatory framework, and education. This morning we, we heard uh, a lot of education will be determinant to be able uh, for the countries to still uh, attract investment and uh, uh, to to be able to play an important role. So I think also the responses have to be multifaceted, but technology, where I see the biggest hope and opportunities has to be a, a, a major element of uh, 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 developing countries, and that's the perspective I'm taking, to uh, focus in order to attract investment. Thank you. Thank you, Bernardo. Please, Fatima Al-Arabi. She is a founder and CEO of Alaf Capital. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Fatima Larabi. I'm the founder of Alaf Capital. We're based in Switzerland. So I have a different background from my uh, fellow panelists here because I come from a financial background. And the, the topic I will be discussing or laying in, uh, before you today is the, is the impact of protectionism short-term and long-term on the financial industry. So if I may uh, start uh, in a very simplistic and elegant way, which is how the Chinese president, Mr. Xi, described protectionism, he said, it's like, like locking yourself in a dark room because you want to protect yourself from the rain and the storms. But he said, at the same time, you will be depriving yourself from the sunlight and from the oxygen. So this is in the, in the World Economic Forum. This is how he described protectionism, which is very simplistic and, and elegant at the same time. So um, now my colleagues will talk about the bilateral agreements and, you know, and um, the protectionism in another dimension. What I will be talking about is the short-term impact and the long-term impact. And uh, what... Uh, Protectionism is not really um, a solution, actually. It is, uh, uh, you know, you are trying to correct a mistake, 
by doing another one. And the mistake for me personally, I mean, stems back to a few years when everybody was advocating for globalization. And then, uh, you know, some countries, big, big countries with high income, decided, you know, driven by, again, by the corporate DNA, uh, the DNA of corporates and profitability to increase their profitability. So they said globalization is great. What we're gonna do is go and offshore our manufacturing. So basically, we're talking about a phenomena of deindustrialization. If we take U.S. for for example, and changing from a manufacturing country into a service country, and this is why today they have this dilemma, and this is why we are in the financial industry. We see yo-yos in the market every day. We know we don't know how to hedge. For this, is it gonna just be a trade tariff? Is it gonna just be noise? Is it gonna be a full, fully fledged war, trade war? So it is to be seen. If I have one more minute, um, you know, to, going back to the to the fact of changing from manufacturing to 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 service industry. If you take the FANGs, you know, the biggest companies that make the the U.S. economy. Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google, and Alphabet. So if you take these companies, I mean, Amazon is a platform, Google is a platform, Netflix is a platform, and Facebook is a platform. If we take Apple, Apple offshored most of manufacturing capability outside. So that's why today we are in this dilemma to say, okay, it's been unfair. It's not a win-win situation. So let's let's engage on a trade war. Thank you. Please, Mr. Yonov Frederick Aga, who is Deputy Director General of the World Trade Organization (WTO). Please, Yonov. Okay. Uh, thank Thank you, uh, Kai. I think uh, we need to have the right narrative. Is there anything like new protectionism? No. Protectionism is protectionism, and it has been with us. The only thing that has changed is the way governments react. Because the, in the past, it used to just be like tariffs. But today, governments have more tools at their disposal to restrict trade. And it is not every trade restrictive measure that is protectionism. In the WTO, members have agreements that allow them to countervail subsidies, uh, take safeguard measures, have anti-dumping measures in place. These are legitimate uh, goals. They are allowed to protect the animal health, plant life, their morals, security. These are goals enshrined in the agreements. The only thing is what happens. The reality we have also to look at is why all of us agree trade is important. We are not agreed on the benefits from trade, how to share them, either between countries or within countries. And this is where the pressures come in, within tensions between countries as to who is benefiting more than the other, tensions within countries because the governments have not put in place uh, measures to ensure that the benefits from trade go to every segment of society. So some people are losing, some people are benefiting. So the conversation we have today is more about losers of trade than those benefiting from trade. And my uh, appeal to all of us is to also try to tell our stories of those benefiting from trade. And it is these tensions that we in our governments that the politicians latch on. And I keep making the point, we think politicians have the solutions to our problems, but sometimes they are the problems. So, Let's look at it reali uh, in, in reality. What is the cause of these problems? Most of our countries have lost 
competitiveness, manufacturing competitiveness. Some have undergone tremendous technological advancement, which has reduced uh, manufacturing uh, employment. So people are losing jobs. What measures have government put in place to create safety nets to take care of those who are losing jobs or those who are losing markets? Finally, I think we need to look forward from two perspectives. What do governments need to do? In the WTO, we provide a platform for them to negotiate agreements, to discuss the problems they have with one another, to settle their disputes, and to ensure that they work for the common good. So we are looking at collective leadership to serve the common good. At the national level also, governments must respond to those who are losing. It's not just uh, countries that lose. Workers need to be re uh, retrained, provided new skills. So how do you have a conversation that enables you have a WTO that is strong, responsive, takes care of your conversation, your needs, and responds differently. So today, many of you would have heard about uh, WTO reform. Reform could mean many things. Reform could mean filling gaps in the current agreements. Reform could mean changing the way we do this, take decisions. Reform could mean uh, strengthening the dispute settlement process that we have. And reform could mean new agreements on completing old uh, outstanding issues. So uh, these are things that, as stakeholders, you need to have a conversation with your governments to make sure that the discussions in the WTO touch on the issues that affect your lives, not the politics of trade. Thank you, Jono. And finally, please, uh, the floor is yours, Dr. Antonio de Lesia, who is university professor, and many other things. Please. Thank you, Kai. Thank you for inviting me to this meeting. Uh, I have the, the privilege of having, coming after so many insights into the problem. And let me uh, emphasize a couple of them. First of all, uh, when you look at the hard facts, don't be blurred by them, uh, because there are not everything that you see when hard facts decline is protectionism. Uh, there is one, one main element, which is uh, natural, which is that uh, the, uh, the global economy has evolved. In the past, let's say over simplified 20 years ago, uh, there was a set of uh, an area of the world that were mainly consumers, uh, US and Europe, and an area that were mainly producers, let's say it, China, oversimplifying things. Now things have evolved. Now the Asian middle classes have, have, uh, have risen and have become a, a main source of demand. They have also become a main source of supply, of, uh, of uh, industrialization. Therefore, the, the value chains um, must adapt. And they don't need to jump from east to west and west to east and west to, and east to west many times in the, in the value chain, they can remain uh, uh, regional. So and this is natural, and, and this is uh, not to be uh, co uh, confused with uh, protectionism. Uh, on top of that, there is uh, also a problem of, uh, of measurement. Uh, some of these uh, flows that have gone down are, are a consequence of, uh, of prices, prices of, uh, of commodities. Uh, co commodity prices have come down, therefore the volume of trade has come down, but does, this doesn't mean that the volume, sorry, the value of trade has come down, but this doesn't, doesn't mean that uh, the value has come down. Second, yeah, there is an element, a clear element, that is protectionism. But let's, let, me, uh, let me add that protectionism has been there for quite some time. And let's take, again, oversimplifying China. China is a protectionist country. I mean, it has been subsidizing uh, its uh, industry for a very long time. It has 
uh, state-owned enterprises that have a, a favored treatment. Uh, the, the, uh, dif I mean, the different thing, what has changed is that uh, China has moved from a really underdeveloped country uh, to one that competes uh, on a level playing field uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, Western, com Western companies. Therefore, uh, now Western companies and Western uh, people, Western citizens say, well, why should we uh, accept that our competitors are, are, are fueled with uh, public money when we are not allowed to do it? And this has generated uh, discontent. Discontent also from the fact that they were promised that globalization would be for everyone, that it would lift all boats, and in fact, a few years later, they see that they, that, that they aren't, that some boats, some, uh, boats in the West have, sink, some have sunk, that some regions uh, are, uh, are uh, declining, uh, and that uh, the average uh, uh, and, and even median uh, wage has uh, stagnated. So again, uh, the citizens see, well, our wages have stagnated, whereas uh, those in the East have, uh, have uh, prospered, that's fine, but uh, uh, it's fine for as long as they behave uh, in, without protectionist measures. If not, then they will apply our own protectionism. If, if the rules are rigged, then we will either correct the rules or we will escape from the rules as some have done or are proposing. Of course, escaping from the rules is not the right solution, and we come to, to whether this is uh, permanent or temporary. No, it's, uh, it can be either. Uh, if it can be either if uh, each side continues to, to blame the other without seeing the, their own problems, then we are there for a permanent problem. If uh, instead each side recognizes that uh, they have uh, policies to change in, each, in, in their own side and certainly in the others, then we may come to some win-win solution. And the win-win solution can come by both addressing the domestic problems, because as I said, Part of the problem with uh, the Western uh, citizens, or some Western citizens, is that uh, many of the benefits, or the benefits that uh, advanced countries have derived from globalization, have been reaped or appropriated by a small sector of the population. Okay. This must be solved. This must be solved through policies that, uh, that empower uh, workers, policies that, uh, that, that uh, uh, implement the level playing field within uh, advanced countries and policies that uh, compensate the, uh, the, those that are losers in this process. On the other side, this will only work if on the, uh, on the eastern side, let's say on, the, on, on China and other rising countries, they correct their own distortions to competition that play to the disadvantage of, uh, of advanced countries of, or some in the advanced countries. So there is a possibility of a win-win solution if both sides really play their own policies in a constructive way. Thank you, Antonio. Dear panelists, if we agree upon, and I suppose we do, that uh, free trade and FDI is beneficial, then uh, we can also note, whatever the, uh, the, the cause is, that we have had a slowdown in the last 10 years. In order to answer the question what to do about this, in order to promote more free trade, more FDI, we have to some extent be a little in agreement about, in order to remedy, which are the main causes for this slowdown. So I would like to ask you this question, if you could give priority, which do you see as the main, the main causes for this slowdown? So that I then can ask the second question, and that is, how do we go ahead? Which are the remedies? You have touched upon it a little here and there, but that is a question that I would like you to elaborate upon regarding the multilateral system, regarding increased regionalism, or whatever. But my first question is so that we can then answer the second question. What do you see as the most important reasons for this slowdown that we have had in the last, let's say, 10 years. Please, uh, Amal. 
Um, I would like to flag uh, two important points uh, that are related to causes, but could also amplify uh, the side effects of uh, protectionism. One, uh, it's not only about uh, the rise of new uh, regulatory framework that could be restricting investment and trade, but it's more about the enforce enforcement of existing laws. And this rigorous enforceability uh, uh, could uh, lead to a greater conditionality, which means that it is attached to a, a mechanism of regulatory approval to uh, achieve a specific investment or trade goal. This is a risk. A second one um, is uh, how the private sector or the investors could find a way to cope. The coping mechanism in itself could create a domino effect because uh, uh, as a coping mechanism, uh, companies um, resort to shortening their supply chains. And this could not only compromise the quality of the outputs, but it is leading to loss of jobs. And most of the time, it could be value-added jobs. In this case, this could, this could be a barrier for the best type of investment countries and governments are seeking, which is the efficiency and value-added investor uh, um, that governments are really after for knowledge transfer and technology transfer. I, would, I just wanted to underline those uh, important risks. Thank you, Amal. Your note, please. Yeah, I think you, you asked two valid questions, but I think the challenge lies in our national governments. In, in? Our national governments. Okay. The policymakers still think, even under the current environment, that they can pro promote trade and investment on two different tracks, which is not possible. In today's environment, where production networks are driven by value chains, and the digital economy has become very critical, investment decisions, trade decisions, must be seen as two sides of the same coin. Because you could attract investment if you have the right trade policy in place. The same way you could attract trade if you have the right investment policy. And I think we are sitting in a country that has used investment to drive trade, just like you would also see other countries have used trade to, to, to drive investment. So if you don't do that, then you end up with slow growth. Slow growth affects trade. Slow growth and slow trade leads to economic decline. Poor consumer welfare, loss of jobs, so if you want to find solutions to these problems, it's not through blaming trade or blaming your trading partners, but seeing how you rethink your trade policy to take into account the new, frontier, the new frontiers that have become available to you. Maybe you were a commodity trading country, but now, based on your location, you could become a major maritime blue economy oriented country. So these are the things that we need to look at. And you can now begin to attract investment into the new sectors you have highlighted along with the trade and uh, other flows that come with it. Uh, please, Fatima. Yeah, um, I beg to differ, differ a little bit from the views because uh, I mean, exactly 10 years ago, the major crisis, major, major balance sheet crisis happened. And then if you compare it to other crises and how quickly the economy picked up after, we are in good shape, actually. And according to the IMF, we, we, the, the economy is picking up. But now, why do we, why do we call it slowing? Uh, you know, economies, it's very simple. It's, if you com compare it to the immersion, 
uh, economy, you know, that, that is um, affecting actually the, the percentage of the U.S. GDP to the global GDP by 10%. It's actually shrinking it by 10%. This is where, if you look at it this way, then you see, yeah, it's slowing down. But if you, if you look at it at the emerging market, then no, actually, they are, they are picking up. And even at the expense of the uh, share of the U.S. GDP of the global, global GDP. Now, where the, the, this talk is coming from and this dispute are coming from basically are related more to some practices. So we hear very often, uh, you know, problems and conflicts about IP, intellectual property. More importantly, it's about the enforced uh, transfer of technology, whereby if you are a country, uh, you know, and you have offshored your manufacturing capabilities to another country, to, to another region of the world, be it China, be it India. And then if they learn this techno technology from you, they call it enforced because this is one of the trades that was discussed. It's like you wanna come, you wanna manufacture in our country, then you have to teach us how you do it. So yes, the core technology can, st can still belong to the mother company, wherever it is, but the skills are being transferred, and guess what? You learn, you copy, maybe you do it better afterwards. So this is where basically it's, it's about IP, it's about uh, enforced transfer of technology, where most of the disputes are taken from, and of course cyber intrusion as well. So, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats. And if it's working, why, I mean, if it's not working, why fix it? It has been good, it has been doing well, the economy is speaking fine. You know, why do we want to put hindrances and, and objections and then we say in French, mettre le bâton dans les roues, which is you put sticks in the wheels. The, everything is turning, leave it turning, you know, it's, it's doing fine. Thank you. Bernardo, when we talk about uh, causes and explanations, you underlined very much and uh, so did now uh, Fatima, the technological aspect. You highlighted that. Yeah, and uh, the technological aspect, I think, is something that took us a bit by surprise. Uh, it is a paradigmatic change. But before that, I would like still to, 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 to maintain the, the course of the discussion, because I think uh, you, uh, Fatima referred to, to the crisis 10 years ago. and. Uh, we went to, 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 to a moment of ultra-liberalism. Free trade market, uh, ru uh, the rule of the market, has led us to this wonderful uh, process of growth and globalization and the positive side of globalization, but had one big problem there, inequalities. Yeah? Uh, and the response has been from the politicians. The politician came and their response is protectionism, but with a bad reading, because we are going from a um, uh, uh, ultra-liberalism to a protectionism, while it was a matter of, of m maintaining the right calibration, if I may say so, of how much market is allowed. We heard uh, Mr. Morales just before, uh, while he has a, a, a leftist government, he is opening up to the market to also attract investment. In terms of, of technology, I think that definitely uh, this is one of, of the uh, uh, roots, not, not of pro protectionism, but this is one of the roots of the change of our paradigm and the way business will happen in the future. Uh, because uh, I, I repeat, there will be a reshoring of many companies and um, a, 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 there is the need to insist in uh, preparing the countries to a different uh, uh, production uh, process a different production paradigm. So I think that technology is a very important element in the way we have to look into the future and that technology is not part of this protectionism but is one additional element. And this is where I say we need to look at the different aspects as part of the same in a systemic manner. Uh, and here I would just like to add one uh, more element, which is uh, climate change and the environmental challenge. We need uh, also through technology to move to a circular economy. In some European countries, uh, we are starting to listen more what the consumers are saying, but we need to be also responsive 
in relation to the needs of the environment. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Andrea, if I understood you correctly, you said that, okay, there's much talk about uh, protectionism, but quite a lot of liberalization is still going on. Absolutely. It is going on, uh, especially in those countries that realize that uh, it's not just attracting FDI that is important, but it's important to attract a high-quality FDI. So going back to your question and to the way you put it, it's not so much uh, how to increase uh, globalization, but how to achieve uh, good globalization and uh, globalization that doesn't fail the people. And I guess that is what Bernardo was referring to, was the problem of uh, the early 2000 about uh, the uh, free willing liberalism that took hold at the time. And uh, there is a perception that uh, uh, this uh, liberalism, uh, this, uh, uh, the, the M&Es, uh, this particular big business, fed the people. And uh, how do we um, go out of this uh, conundrum? I think it's uh, through an effort which must be collective and, if possible, must should also be multilateral at uh, rebuilding the social contract, which uh, may seem just an expression uh, kind of uh, devoid of uh, real content, but it, it is the basis of uh, any society. And from this point of view, let me just finish uh, on, on one point, I guess, is that uh, there is a need to recognize uh, that uh, business has uh, to achieve a license, has to merit a license to operate in the global society. And this uh, should be through uh, instruments of uh, responsible business conduct. So it is important to be engaged in philanthropic activities, but it's not enough. The corporate social responsibility is not enough. I guess we have to move to the next uh, step, uh, and the next step is responsible business conduct uh, and how to build an international system that is conducive to responsible business conduct. So public policy, but obviously also corporate efforts. Thank you. As you saw, I just got my small instructions here. So uh, uh, we have got uh, five minutes left. So I would like to uh, uh, give you one minute each, and that is to conclude answering the question. Where do you think that we stand in five or ten years? Or what shall we do in order to promote free trade, more free trade, more FDI? We start back there, please, uh, Antonio. One, one minute each, and then we have to conclude. That's very easy, one minute. <laughs> <laughs> so what I would say is, uh, well, there are two scenarios. One, we continue like we, like we are doing, and then we, are, we will not uh, escape the uh, protectionism. The other is to reduce, the positive scenario is to reduce or remove the distortions at national level and at international level that create the distortions, the, the anxieties that are at the basis of protectionism. Thank you, Antonio. You know? Well, I think uh, we all have to agree that protectionism does no one any good. We all lose at the end. So if the current tensions escalate, the whole global economy will go into Timo and will have more problems. So my suggestion would be members should continue to talk, share their problems, see how best they can respond to concerns being expressed to find the way forward. But to think that you can pull the plug on the global trading system or on multilateral cooperation and still benefit, you will be sinking yourself too. Thank you. Thank you, Yono. Please, Fatima. So I can tell you actually, uh, you know, bottom up. So let's say we go ahead with protectionism, saying that, you know, this, this does good. So I will tell you what are some of the consequences. So first of all, of course, you know, when, when you have no choice, you go to a supermarket and then you only have to buy local products because foreign products are, are not there. These local products, you know, which, uh, will, which by definition will become more expensive to you because the cost of production is higher and because the raw material are more expensive and so on and so, so forth. So you have more expensive products that you can and less purchasing power so so what happens here we're talking about prices increasing 
So this is inflation. Inflation is not good for countries in general, and then the central banks will try to fight it by decreasing, by uh, sorry, increasing the interest rates, and then when they increase the interest rates, you go in this vicious circle whereby you don't spend because you want to make more money on, the, on whatever money you have. So you have high, um, uh, more expensive goods, higher inflation, and then the central banks will have to deal with it by increasing interest rates or devaluing the currency. So in all scenarios, I mean, nobody wants a trade war. It's a war after all, and nobody wants it. So the best uh, approach to be is let's find a win-win situation whereby the equilibrium is not like you buy from me $1, I buy from you $1, no. The equilibrium would be compliment me. Give me what I don't have and I give you what you don't have and we live happily ever after. Thank you, Fatma. Thank you. Please, Bernardo. Thank you. Um, to finalize, I would like to say we need a systemic response uh, where the private uh, investment plays a key role. We know that in the future we will need more private investment, we will need more private sector, uh, but we have to regulate also. Because when you see we are talking no globalization, uh, a lot of uh, regionalization is coming up, but out of uh, 100 uh, MEs in the digital economy, 60 belong to only to three countries. This means we have a high level of dominance of the digital economy by global players. So there is a paradox here because the global players are getting more power and it's rather the smaller companies that are disappearing. We need to involve the private sector, the private investment from all levels at the country. Local investment, local quality is important. Quality investment, we call it when it's linked to the local economy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Eduardo. Please, Amal. Um, I think on the governmental level, from a macro perspective, uh, it is very important for uh, countries to rationalize and think very carefully about the context of their regulation and their policies and strategies when it comes to industrial trade or investment uh, strategies and policies. This is very important. Uh, another thing also uh, for uh, countries that don't have this type of awareness for development organizations and institutions to uh, conduct kind of hand-holding uh, technical assistance to connect countries together, at least on a regional level, to benefit from proximity and uh, to in empower them to have uh, the bargaining power uh, so they wouldn't uh, be under the mercy of uh, uh, more dominant countries. On companies' level, uh, businesses uh, who would survive are businesses who will always become more competitive and more relevant. So uh, moving forward, I, I, I see this happening, so I'm not really concerned about the impact of protectionism. Thank you, Amal, and please. Andrew. Thanks. Well, well, we will be in 10 years time, inshallah, we will be in Dubai at AIM 2029 with uh, having great fun because we will have solved all the problems that we are facing today. And uh, hopefully through uh, a new social compact, which uh, will be inclusive and participative and well-funded, and which I think will have a human rights at the corner of responsible business conduct. So the recognition that uh, in all its dimensions, uh, human and labor rights are at the core of uh, innovation, social innovation, and the social development, uh, and the fight against uh, corrupt, um, against poverty. And uh, 2029, 10 years time, will be the year before Agenda 2030 comes to an end. And uh, inshallah, the sustainable development goals will have been reached. I'm not so sure that that will happen, but uh, I guess we must have a vision of what we want to go and what we want to achieve. Thank you. Thank you so much. A big hand for this distinguished panel.